not only is it so unreplayable that I don't want to replay the game, it's that I don't even want to play any other Pokemon game anymore because I feel like I've gotten the whole experience. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined again by Nick Kruger to discuss the topic of replayability in games. Plus, impressions of Pokemon Tournament, and Chris and Doc take on a 200-word RPG challenge. The Backward Compatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 63 of the BackwardCompatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined tonight by Jim. Hey, guys. And I'm joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And for the second week in a row, we are joined by Nick Kruger, my brother and the media or the, the music person for uh, the podcast. Wow, I just, I just feel, feel like I haven't seen you in a week. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. Possibly even two weeks. Possibly even just recording a second episode after mm. the last one. For, yeah, like <laughs> no, don't minutes. give away our trade secrets. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, you guys are stuck with me for another week. Woo! <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. Uh, but, well, that's, yeah, that's what I was sarcastically awkward, implying. Awkward silence. <laughs> well, which I can trim out. I for, one, like, yeah. I, for one, am very glad that Nick is with us again. Yes, I'm glad that I'm with um, you. Well, later in the show, we're going to actually be talking about replayability in games. This is something that we touched on a little bit. In oh, the that's why you're here again. Yes. 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 So we're going we, to we brought him back. replay this experience. It's been so Nick. long, a whole week, that you forgot why I was here. Precisely. <laughs> yeah. um, so we are going to talk about replayability in games, and, and specifically what makes a game replayable. On the relationship there between game quality and replayability, if there is any. But uh, first, Chris is going to start us off with a button mosh. Get ready for the button mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So recently I bought Pokémon Tournament uh, for the Wii U. It's basically Tekken with Pokémon, and um, it's pretty pretty cool, actually. It's... um. The first oh, that's where the name comes from. Yes. Wait, is it really just Tekken with Pokemon? Like, it's like a fighting game? Yes, it's a fighting game. Is it made by the Tekken people? Yes, it's made by uh, Bandai Namco. Namco. Yeah, they all serious? make sense. Namco. They didn't call it Tekkenmon? No. <laughs> is it a different thing? Where you've got, like, robot? That'll be the other console. <laughs> where it's, like, okay. Tekken characters, but it's a JRPG. Oh. I'm getting so confused here. So, <laughs> so you fight with the Pokemon? Yes. Like, you have combos? and Yeah. Uh, it's actually, it's pretty neat. So... It actually, it, it's a little bit of a high, yeah, Jim's mind is blue. He, yeah, I mean, he made the mind blue. <laughs> I, I just, I thought I was out of the loop, but now I understand it was a choice. It was a conscious choice not to engage with these things. I, I honestly <laughs> thought Pokken Tournament, I thought it was something like, oh, because it's an import from Japan, and in Japan they don't call them Pokemon, they call mm. them Pokken. I had this whole story <laughs> background in my head of like why it was called Pokken Tournament. Actually, and it's it was a, totally wrong. It's actually a fighting game in which you just poke people. Yeah. And then it's a bracketed system, so you get to the top and you're... And that could also be an interesting game, too, where you don't actually fight each other, you just kind of come forward and That's a fun party game. That's a VR sort of... That's, you know what? That's we called just, Facebook. We nice. just pitched a yeah, game. Yeah, exactly. I was about to say Facebook. Facebook. It's, a, it's a Facebook game. Oh, is poking, is poking still a thing? A poking tournament, yeah. It's hidden, but it's there. Uh, oh. <laughs> so Mark Zuckerberg already... So Pokemon stuff. social media is what we're yeah. playing right now. Pokemon Go? Uh, anyway, uh, bringing you guys back to... video games. Back to video games. Um... It's actually, it reminds me a little bit of kind of a hybrid between some of the more, um, like, the anime fighting games you see where it's kind of over-the-shoulder, third-person, you run around in a kind of, like, open, circular arena. Um, oh, like the Dragon Ball yeah. Budokai fighting games. Yeah, Budokai Tenkaichi. Yeah. Um, games like that, and, you know, Tekken, where you've got kind of, like, the, the side-scrolling sort of, you know fight. Um, what they do is they actually have phases, and so you shift between kind of like the more open, you know, you're in a circular oval arena, um, mm -hmm. you're like able to move and do ranged attacks and kind of like trying to play the poking game that way. Wait, you say oval arena. Are you, are you fighting inside a Pokeball? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, is there, there a Pokemon stadium? Uh, yes, there is. Like Smash Bros? Uh, sort of like Smash Bros? Sort of, kind of. There, there's no, like, obstacles in the stage, although occasionally there's, like, little power-ups you can pick up mm -hmm. um, in that, that sort of movement mode. Wait, so what, um, what system? Did you say what system this was for? Wii U. Wii U. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so this is just a one-on-one -on -one fighting game? Yes. 
Like with Tekken with Soul Pokemon. Calibur. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so some of the characters include. Actually, there's a pretty. I, I, I can't wrap my head around this. I'm there, really there's actually a pretty. Time. The gameplay actually it, it works really well. It really uh-huh. it's, it's a really cool game. I've been enjoying it. This is actually um, what I've always wanted out of a Pokemon game where yeah. you actually see the battle. More and more like, action. Yeah, yeah. Not just. Pokemon, here's a thunder smash. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but they. Um, you sort of go around and you're, you're sort of playing like this long range battle where you close in or avoid and then you can use ranged attacks and stuff like that. And then when you land certain types of hits, you shift into uh, another phase, which is uh, more like a traditional fighting game, um, where actually it's only um, left and right in jumping. Uh, they don't let you like do sidestepping in this particular part. You can do sidestepping in the first phase, but not the second phase when you kind of go to close, co- are, close are these, quarters. Are these phases actually split up into two different segments, or is it, it, it trans- to a certain point in mm. transition? It transitions transition seamlessly. back. Yeah, that's interesting. and so okay. it's it's when you land a certain hit, and then like when you knock someone away, for example, then you exit the the close up mode and go back to like the sort of long range mode, so to speak. It's actually pretty interesting. You do most of your damage, or you have the the best potential for combos in the close up mode. Hmm. Um, so there's an interesting strategy where like you may or may not be trying to avoid that mode depending on your play style. Um, and then it's got some interesting stuff with like a, they call it a synergy meter where over time taking damage, dealing damage, doing special stuff. You can activate like a um, a lot for a lot of it's actually the uh, Pokemon's um, uh, I forget what they called it the the evolution beyond their last one. I think it was like X evolution or something like that. Right. Mega evolution. Mega evolution that they introduced in um, X and Y. Yeah. So you evolve while mm-hmm. you're fighting. Yes. Um, temporarily, at least, and that's kind of like your power up mode where you get to unleash, uh, unleash your ultimate. Attack Are you understanding any of this doc? Uh, yeah, I, okay. I understood a video game <laughs> and uh, po- Pokemon. Poke- it stands for Pocket yeah. Monsters, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, actually, a really cool range of characters. They have uh, anything from Pikachu to Lucario to Bless Champ, you. Charizard. I saw Pikachu in a Luchador outfit. Yeah, yeah. That, that's called Pikachu Libre. Um, it's actually oh kind of awesome. Oh, <laughs> that is both stupid and amazing. Yes. <laughs> that, that's not actually kind, kind of like this game. No. Um, oh, right. is it, is it stupid? Uh, well, no, it's not. It's not stupid. But um, what, it's what's not stupid? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> what is cool about it? Though, listening to this, that's pretty is, high standards. It's what, not what, stupid. What I like about it though is it's an accessible fighting game. It's one yeah. that's got enough depth that it feels like you can actually you know train up and have good competitive tournaments. But it's also not so complex. Like I feel like I could actually master certain combos as someone who's terrible at fighting wow. games. Wow. Yeah. That's saying something. <laughs> um, so it's, it's more about the strategy. It's got kind of like a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors, like this type of move counters this one, which counters this one. Um, and it's all about kind of knowing when to use the right thing to de- defeat your opponent. So um, Pokemon Tournament, really cool uh, game. Uh, really, would you recommend it to non-fighting game fans? I would, actually. I think it's worth trying. Would you um, recommend it to non-Pokemon fans? Possibly. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's not uh, <laughs> it's, at the, all. it's the perfect game. <laughs> would you Nintendo recommend it to non created... gamers? <laughs> <laughs> Depends if they like Pokemon. Would, would you recommend it to Pokemon fans who are also hardcore fighting game fans? Yes. Really? Well, That's sorry. the audience, so there you go. And does it have replay value, which is the theme of the day? Uh, yes, it does, in the sense that it's got a multiplayer component. Wow. We'll get to that later. The perfect game. Wow. <laughs> 10 out of 10. Pokemon right Tournament, here. the perfect game. They've done it. We, we don't even have to make games anymore. <laughs> okay, well, good night, everybody. <laughs> this is Roleplay for Roleplay, the mechanics of tabletop roleplaying games. Moving on, I know y'all have, because we, I, I'm not sure if you talked about it on the show last time, but I know y'all wanted to submit uh, one of your uh, role-playing game concepts to this 200-word uh, RPG challenge. Mm-hmm. And we may not have mentioned it on the show a couple weeks back. We, we did Maybe no. we did. I don't know. We, we were talking about it after the show. Okay, after the show. Yeah. But um, I'm kind of interested because I don't think you ever actually told me what system you were planning to pitch <laughs> oh, okay. for it. But uh, did you go ahead and submit? Uh, so, yeah, what I think both Doc and I did do, and uh, Brian actually has been on the show, McKittrick, um, he submitted his own game as well. So the idea is that there was a challenge put up on the internet um, for you to submit either a RPG or an RPG supplement of some sort in 200 words or less, um, which is a very, very tight word count for something as yeah, potentially is. complicated as an RPG. Um, and the doc suggestion is that I look at some of the games that I've designed and see if I could sort of condense them into, into 200 words, which um, I didn't really have any in particular that I wanted to do that with, but I did um, give it a little bit of thought, and after about a week or so, of brainstorming and not having any inspiration, inspiration struck one day, and I decided to go ahead and submit my 200 word RPG. Um, but Doc, do you want to talk a little bit about yours first and kind of your direction and yeah, maybe um, read your game? 
Uh, you know, it, it was kind of interesting because Brian was the one who found it mm-hmm. and turned it on to us. So I, I feel it only fair to uh, talk about his too. Mm-hmm. In the we collaborated, and you're supposed to really only submit in one person's name, and so that gave us an opportunity to do two. Mm-hmm. So we really both assisted one another in each other's. Um, and mine was called Allegory: The Derivative RPG. And it was based on a quote from uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. You le- use a lot of words, by the way, just for the title. So yes, uh, actually, oh, does the title, does the title count? count? When you submit, there's a form that they had, and they had a separate field for the title. Okay. okay. And then you paste in the body of your text, and what they would do is basically, you, if you copied that um, body text, put it into Google Docs, and use the Google Docs word count tool. That's their way of measuring the word count. Okay. Right. So. The quote from J.R.R. Tolkien is, I cordially dislike allegory in all of its manifestations. Hmm. And so, of course, that's exactly what we did. Uh, <laughs> this is a game where it's every... nine words, by the way, so you're already pretty, pretty deep in... Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, you know, there are word counters in words. You're, you're so committed. Too. You've already um, committed. <laughs> this is a game where every movie, TV show, comic book trope, and stereotype you know is validated. You need six note cards, a pen, and an embarrassingly large knowledge of cultural references per player. We're good on that. Uh, <laughs> set up. Take six cards each. Write two objects, two events, two characters. Pass three cards left, the other three right. Write what each thing symbolizes. Continue passing on, not back. These are your cards. So what you've got in front of you is cards written by other players, and uh, the symbols are, are, are written by different players than the ones who wrote them down. Gameplay. Story happens across five acts with various scenes as needed. The first to say, I have one, plays a card and describes what happens to him using the symbolic element on the card as inspiration for a conflict. Players may buy into the scene by playing one of their cards and doing the same or starting a new scene in the same way. When everyone has played a card for the act, a new act begins in the same way following form. Acts must follow this format. Act 1, conflict. Act 2, complications. Act 3, the twist. Act 4, Four, climax and act five resolution hmm. so that's allegory the epic rpg now i, I seriously think we need to uh, field test this because this has not been play tested mm. at all mm. well what i find is 200 funny, words and too, the, so. the inspiration uh like the the it's not lost on me what you were doing with that mm-hmm. because tolkien doesn't like allegory and yet his work is one that's been analyzed over and over again as an allegory, allegory. Yeah, right, right, yeah, um, right and so what you're doing is you're giving people symbols that they didn't come up with right and they're <laughs> assigning their symbolism to something that someone else i really with. like that mm. uh, yeah, it so. feels like english class all over again I, well i'm an english <laughs> teacher or at least i used to be so well, there high, you school, go. high school english yeah cool. well that's what i mean over, yeah 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 i mean i'm, I'm a certified <laughs> english teacher on a on a 6 to 12 level. Nick was very specific. He's like, no, no, no. Not not a college English professor. <laughs> well, I, 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 a high school English teacher. Are, are they full of yourself? Are they a little bit better in college? I don't no, know. actually. I, much worse. No, no, no. I'm, yeah. <laughs> All right, so now now I'm going to go ahead. And, and within the, the, the context of that inspiration, uh, we then, and this was the order in which we did them, mm. uh, we then decided that we were going to do epic poem the RPG, and we realized the only proper way to do epic poem the RPG was, of course, in poetic verse. Yes, I figured. (laughs) A game of role-play in epic verse, amateur bards opposed converse. Agree on a hero, his tale to tell. Secretly write three deeds as well. Minor, major, and epic deeds. Twelve tokens for these story seeds. Minor deeds, one token awards. Common tasks done without swords. Major deeds, two tokens takes. Quests and problems, higher stakes. Epic deeds, the greatest quest. Three tokens take, proven best. Begin the tale with epic rhyme, but take too long, you're out of time. A bard who pauses, lost in thought, may be interrupted. Take his spot, but finish the rhyme while he pales, and by all means continue your tale. When all the tokens between are one, finish up. Your tale is done. The greatest bard, most tokens gained, is crowned the victor. This game's explained. That was beautiful. What just happened? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> that was just like high school English class. <laughs> it was beautiful. What does it mean? <laughs> that actually reminds me a little bit of uh, Once Upon a Time, in that you're trying to tell a story, but if you take two, if you pause or you kind of like lose your steam, someone else can. That's jump exactly in. where we got that mechanic from. Actually, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah that's exactly where it was from. Uh, so it's pretty simple. You've got. I'd, 12... have, to, I'd have to do some more reading to. Yeah, to, to so. It's like deciphering like actual poetry. Yeah, uh, twelve tokens in the middle. You've got to tell your story, but you got to rhyme when you do it. And if you can't come up with a rhyme or you take too long, then uh, the next person jumps in who can finish the rhyme. Does it have to be in a poetic meter? Yeah, no. No, we just said rhyme. Okay. <laughs> but it's cooler if it is. If you can freestyle a hype. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say, just freestyle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and, and to be fair, it took us about an hour to come up with the rhymes for that. So <laughs> uh, this is not a, not a proven concept. But, yeah. you know, the truth is that the ancient bards, if you will, did sometimes make stuff up on the fly. And, oh, yeah. uh, you know, totally. the, the beard color would change because Sven was there and he was the town drunk and everybody knew it. And so his red beard, you know, came a part of the story and ha 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 ha, Hrothgar now has a red beard. And it's funny. Um, it's really fascinating the way they did that sort of thing because they knew the meter so very well they were able to do it. Kind of reminds me of Whose Line Is It Anyway, if you remember that old show. So, mm-hmm. Anyway, th- those are our two submissions. And uh, I'll go and talk about my game really quickly. Um, I was actually looking at some of the uh, the finalists from last year's competition. This is the second year they were doing it. And um, one of the finalists that was kind of interesting to me was um, a game where they actually took matches. You had a collection of matches and you would burn the matches um, when you do certain actions. Basically, when you, run, when you burn all your matches, then you're out of the game. Um, and so I kind of liked that that thing they did with taking an object and having that be part of the the mechanic that is cool um, and so i wanted to see if i could do something kind of like that and for some reason my head went to um that scene in breaking bad where skylar's having an intervention uh or refuses <laughs> to call it an intervention i have uh, the talking pillow. i i have the talking pillow <laughs> um and insisting that whoever is speaking take the talking pillow yeah. not uh, the scene where she just starts she just keeps screaming shut up <laughs> for minutes. that's that's much that's later. far later <laughs> um But so I I have a game that I call The Talking Pillow, uh, and I have a little twist on it. So my game is as follows. For five plus players, the organizer has called an intervention to confront the subject. Everyone else is a quote-unquote loved one. The organizer wants the subject to to do or stop doing the thing. It can be whatever, goofy or serious, but make sure everyone's comfortable. Send the subject to another room. Get them an audio feed. For now, they play The Talking Pillow. Loved ones each flip a coin to answer these questions, yes or no. Secret until shared. Lying is allowed. Currently guilty of the thing. Ever been before. Are you personally on the organizer's side? The organizer produces a literal pillow. Only the holder may speak. When a loved one, not the organizer, holds it, give them headphones. They can hear the talking pillow. <laughs> the pillow thinks so it's hold- literally a talking pillow. Yes, but only they can hear. Nice. That's uh, kind of creepy and awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not a talking pillow. It's a talking pillow. Yes. <laughs> it's oh. buff. Um, the pillow thinks this whole thing is ridiculous. They may prompt, pry, persuade, or distract. They can't be muted. And don't talk to the pillow. That's just weird. Organizer makes sure everyone talks about their feelings at least once. Then call the subject back. They get the pillow for one final speech. Organizer calls a vote. Loved ones decide if they will or will not force the subject to do or stop the thing, regardless of their personal view. And so the idea here is that you're having an intervention. The organizer can't hear the pillow because they're just dead set on, like, they're going to get the subject to stop what they're doing. But since the subject isn't really talking, not really saying anything this entire time, they're getting to play the talking pillow. So we kind of, like, have them play two roles in the game. Oh, so the organizer is also the talking pillow? No, the subject is. Oh. It's like, you know, in that scene from Breaking Bad, it's Walt. Yeah. He would be the talking pillow. Or the person playing Walt would be playing the talking pillow. Interesting. Yeah. Because they're not talking until the very end. Oh, so, so they don't even enter the room. Yeah, well, in the fiction, they're implicitly in the room, but they're just sitting there listening for everyone else to sort of speak their piece, and so then oh. they get to say their thing. So that's the okay. Um, now, I wanted to make sure there was that, that final speech, kind of like what Walt does at the very end, where he yeah. like basically makes his decision. Um, but then uh, whoever is speaking, uh, they kind of like come at it from their angle based on the coins that we flip. And then um, the talking pillow can basically be a voice in their head while they're trying to talk. So I imagine I, I definitely picture this as a funny game. I don't. Think I can see this be... getting really dark. Really <laughs> yeah, quickly. yeah. I could. <laughs> which is why you keep it fictional. Which Isn't is that what they said on the forum? Yeah, they did actually. <laughs> um, you, you keep it fictional. You don't make it personal, um, and you uh, probably should just make it something funny. Um, but then, like while you're talking about your feelings, the talking pillow is talking to you in your head, but nobody else can hear you, and so it's probably going to create some 
insane person kind of moments. Believe it or not, we're not always playing games. Every now and then, we like to talk about the other stuff. A little while ago, um, I decided to go back in and finish a series that I had dropped. And I dropped it for various reasons, but... um, Mostly it was unfinished is the reason I had had dropped it. And that is the series Merlin. Now this is the self-same Merlin where young Merlin uh, meets up with young Arthur, Prince Arthur, who is um, under his father Uther, who is still alive and well and ruling the kingdom of Camelot. This is a BBC British It is the British BBC television show. So they actually believe this happened. Yes. Because they're British. <laughs> well, precisely. precisely. It would seem so, uh, based on the uh, the last episode. But, well, I'll get there. We'll have to verify with Bradley next time we have him on. Oh, okay. There you go. <laughs> um, but regardless... Well, the, the, would you like, the, like to discuss our Lord and Savior King Arthur? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Merlin. Merlin. Oh, He's the, the messianic one? figure. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, but regardless, what, what happened is... Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the show somewhat, but some of the things like the antagonism between the two characters, the, the sort of um, uh, anachronism of the whole thing, you know, the sword in the stone never happened. It was one that's of my favorite got, cartoon, you know, cartoons when I was a kid. Yeah, that's Disney. what got me when I tried to watch it. Yeah, show. none Same of that deal. stuff was there until the last season. And actually, the setup happens right before the last season. Mm. Uther finally dies, which is fantastic and wonderful that he's because the guy just gets ah, crazy um and, and as a result of this some of the things important things have happened a dragon forged sword has uh, become embedded in the stone in order to keep it safe um you know you've got uh morgana who is uh, his sister who has gone off and she's become an evil witch officially uh, by the way it's really important to the to, for the whole series the whole setup of the series is that magic is illegal um, the old religion has has been completely outlawed. So Merlin is hiding the fact that he is a wizard all the way up until literally the last two part episode. Um, no one, uh, except for select few people, know about it. But no one in the kingdom uh, who, who's of a high you know authority knows about it. Is this the end of the series, or is there more coming? No, it's the end of the series. Very much so. Two seasons. Um, what do you mean? Is it? Well, you said you you left because it was no. It's about it's about six seasons actually. Okay. Yeah. There's there's a there's a six season. Uh, but the point is that uh, I, th- somebody told me, you know what? Uh, go back in and just give it a try. Watch that last season. It's worth it. There's a payoff. I agree. Um, if you at any point abandoned the series Merlin because you just couldn't figure out how it was going to end the way it should. I encourage you to go back in. They do a lot of really cool things. And this is where I'll give my my spoiler alert, because I am going to talk about it. But what happens is, first of all, um, Arthur becomes the king at the end of the, I think it's fifth season. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is, three years pass. And all that King Arthur stuff we know about happens. We don't, we don't see it established. We don't see him decide, I know, I'll have a round table. No, none of that. Has, and so what happens is three years is long enough to be able to say he is a good king, uh, he has united the kingdoms, and he has done all these wonderful things, and Merlin's been in the background helping him, and he doesn't realize it. But then he's deposed. Um, he's literally just, just thrown out. The, the kingdom is overthrown, and he has nothing. And in that moment of having nothing, uh, it's, well, how can I convince the, the people that I am the king, the right wise born, blah, blah, blah. And Merlin goes, I know. There's a sword and a stone. You go and you pull it. And what happens is all the stuff we expect from the Arthur legend is then reintroduced in the, the last season. There's prophecies of his death. You expect Mordred to be the one to do it, who's one of his knights. Um, there's this really cool way that they work in uh, the, the Lancelot and Guinevere uh, betrayal, and it's that she's under a spell, and it's actually on their wedding day, which is pretty amazing. The wedding is canceled. She goes and be, you know back to being a peasant again, which she was. Um, and, and, and Lancelot nobly you know, sacrifices himself in order to, you know, make everything right. And when he's brought back, it's kind of like as a zombie kind of creature, not really like ugly zombie, but like a mind controlled guy. It all works. And it, up till the very last moment, you're, you're working in, there's the spell that Merlin casts on himself about the fourth season where he can appear old. Sometimes he's old, sometimes he's young, sometimes he's the, and, and they, they don't recognize who he is. So now the big reveal for you, if you don't want to if you don't want to actually watch it I'm just going to tell you at the end of it Arthur actually dies 
He needed to, and I wanted him to, but he does it with a shard of a, a dragon forged blade that works its way up to his heart from Mordred's killing blow, and it takes him two episodes to die. You, you, the thing is, it's a wonderful, wonderful sequence because he bonds with his best friend, Merlin. He ta- tells him the truth, that he's actually a, a wizard and that he's actually helped him through all these different ways. First he's mad and then he kind of changes over and the very last thing he says before he dies is, I'm going to tell you something I never told you, my servant, Merlin. Thank you. And Merlin kind of buries him on the lake. Uh, by putting him out on a boat, and it's the Lake of Avalon, and he goes off, and then it cuts over. We we hear, the king is dead, long live the queen, and Guinevere is crowned queen. And then we cut back over to Avalon, and a truck, I mean, lorry, <laughs> goes by. Right? Is and, this like Monty Python ending? No, no. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and the camera pans, weapon, guys. the camera pans, and then what you've got is old Merlin walking down the road and he kind of looks at the camera and he looks at the island and he just passes the once and future king well he was always immortal within Uh, the context of it but uh, you know he is magic but the idea uh, the really cool idea at the end is yeah he'll come back he'll be back whenever whenever England needs him (laughs) Arthur will be back so he's the messianic figure as you said oh yeah actually he is now that I think about it so um, regardless the point is um, if for those of you who abandoned the series because you didn't like the lack of Arthurian elements they're all crammed into that last I don't season. even know our Arthurian legend that well so this could be interesting well there's actually dozens of them and that's the irony mm-hmm. is that you know we we look at Mort d'Arthur and things like that which are actually very French mm-hmm. legends which is highly uh, ironic to French. me French I know right? <laughs> um, and, and we you know there's a lot of combination and recombination but honestly if you just take it put it in a blender and, and call that seasons one through five and then the last season um, which I think is six it might actually be five but uh, the point is the last season does all the really cool stuff mm. Meaty topic of discussion. Yeah, so replay replayability in games. This is something that um, I think video games, especially unlike movies. I know some people that don't rewatch any movies. Um, I know some people that hate it. I mean, I don't. I, I rewatch movies all the time. But um, like, I know, for example, my sister. She she doesn't like to do that. My dad doesn't like rewatching movies for the most part. So, um, but in video games, I think because you're actually interacting with it, it's an interactive experience, um, they lend themselves more to replayability, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every game is just as replayable as another. Mm-hmm. Um, and the experience for replaying the game might differ between the game. So, uh, I, Nick, I know you suggested this topic. Do you want to talk a little bit about replayability? Um, well, I've, I've, I think something that makes a game replayable is uh, uh, in narrative-heavy games where there's lots of different endings, or at least a couple of different endings, because that's that's designed so that you can replay it. So that's a good place to start. Is it? I, think. I mean, do would you say? Because I'm not so sure that's necessarily true. It's designed to give you um, a, an experience that feels like your own mm-hmm. um, by giving you choice or, or even just false choice, so that when you go back, so when you go back and replay it, especially if those choices were not really um, very divergent, and were not actually real choices. You yeah. just felt like real choices, and this well, is something that comes across in, in Telltale games, yeah. where you feel like you're actually making a choice the first time you play through. Mm-hmm. But the second time you play through, you go, "Oh, I'm going to do this other thing now and see what happens." Mm-hmm. No, it's the same thing's pretty much going to mm-hmm. happen. There's, there's very, very quickly you find there's a bottleneck. Like I know in the first season, there was a choice between um, who do you save, one character or another, and I forget the exact characters. It doesn't matter. Um, but whoever you choose to save, the other one is still going to die mm-hmm. in the very next the very next episode because you, you like leave them behind or something like that. I forget exactly how it works. But the point is that you it's end a false up, choice. Yes, you end up with neither character yeah. with, mm-hmm. with your party. It's not like you get to keep one till the end. So um, I think sometimes in narrative heavy games, it's the reverse. Mm-hmm. It's uh, you really would prefer not to replay it mm-hmm. um, if you're at least if you're going for for a different choice. When I said narrative heavy, I was thinking something less Telltale because I don't I haven't played a lot uh-huh. of Telltale games. I was thinking something more along the lines of Knights of the Old Republic, where like an RPG. I was, yeah. gonna, I was yeah. actually going to say for as much crap as the collective podcast has given Mass Effect for being binary in its morality system. Yeah, there is something to be said for if you play through first on Paragon, you can actually get a fairly different experience mm-hmm. playing through again on um, Renegade. 
uh, and vice versa. Now that's like, you know, sometimes I think you go back and you replay Mass Effect to have a another exp- another go at the game the gameplay it's not just the story that, but that being said you do also, you do get a different flavor the second but, time but, through. Yeah. but nick's talking about a much better game knights of the old republic <laughs> let's, move back, let's move back to that game. well with knights of the old republic and this is kind of um because it's a sort of a linear story i mean you can choose which like missions you take first and, mm-hmm. and in which order and you can react to those differently depending on your character you could take different party members yeah but it's a linear story but right? u- yeah ultimately it's a linear story and, and in that sense it feels more like re-watching a movie which i is something i do mm-hmm. enjoy especially when i've seen the movie and i know what's coming and i can kind of pick out some of the foreshadowing going into oh, it yeah um but what's what's interesting about Nets of the Old Republic is that d- the dark side choices you make and the light side choices you make don't really have an effect, but it helps you as the player kind of get an, a sense of what your character is going to be yeah, throughout you, the game. You put a contact, you, you see the game through your own con- or through your own lens, yeah. essentially. Mm-hmm. So um, even though the same sort of experiences are happening um, to you, it feels different because of the, the, the sort of character that you're playing. And I'd or argue role that, playing, one might say. And I, yeah. I'd argue the same thing happens actually in Telltale games, where you know you could, for example, in The Wolf Among Us, play one run through as Good Big or Good B, Big B, uh, and the next one you play more as Bad Big B. See, see, I tried that, and honestly, I, I couldn't do it because it just felt I I, I was exposed to. Um, the underlying falsehood of all the choices, so sure. it, it kind of broke the experience. Yeah, that's me. true. But but going back to the the, the role playing games, which I think yeah. um, they do sort of lend themselves to that. Uh, one example that I wanted to bring up was Chrono Trigger, which is one of my favorite games. I've replayed it multiple times. Um, the thing that I find, um, and for that same sort of a reason, where it's, it is a linear story, however. Um, you do have multiple party members, so depending yeah. on the different combinations of party members that you have, you get a different experience as you play through the game. Um, that but, is one thing I liked about Mass yes. Effect, actually. Yeah, but also you do have um, this other option, which goes into the replayability, uh, which is the New Game Plus, which mm-hmm. is something that Chrono Trigger has. And one of the yeah. cool things you can do with the New Game Plus um, is you start with, you know, for example, you start with like some of your in-game equipment and mm-hmm. things like that, or different levels. Um, but also, you you because you start with these these levels, you're able to essentially beat the game before you're supposed to be able to beat the game. Um, there's this, this is a spoiler, by the way, for a game that's like 25, 30 years old at this point. <laughs> um, but uh, it's probably not that old. Um, about 25, I think. But uh, uh, you're the whole point of the game at the very end. You're supposed to uh, stop the end of the world from uh, Lavos or, or Lavos, how you pronounce that name. It's, it looks like this big porcupine-looking uh, creature thing. <laughs> um, and uh, but anyway, so the first time that you fight him, uh, you essentially you can't win because your character, your characters are your party members are just not powerful enough. So Chrono has to sacrifice himself so that you all can continue to live. You think that you win, but you don't really. You kind of have to go. Th- continue your journey there's a lot more to the game after that mm. um this the next time through because your character is so much more powerful you can actually win that battle and you can end the game prematurely or you get a totally different ending huh interesting um yeah actually i think there are a lot of jrpgs that do new game plus really well a couple i want to talk about quickly um persona 4 has a pretty nice uh, oh, new yeah. game plus where um you get to keep your ranks and things like uh, diligence and in- intelligence and that sort of stuff courage um you also get to keep a lot of your equipment um, so you can actually get through the game a lot easier. Um, so it, it goes quicker the second time through. Um, <clears throat> but it also, because Persona 4 has so much openness as far as who you spend your time with and at what points, mm-hmm. for one, the having all your stats leveled up, um, the, all the sort of like a- outside the combat stats leveled up, allows you to... Um, get some dialogue options and like some events that you might not have been able to access before because you weren't a high enough rank. Um, so in that sense, lets you see some new things. But it also lets you explore other entire side stories. You know, you get to bond with this character that you didn't bond with before, that sort of thing. <clears throat> so that's one of those games where it's got so much content that it's kind of worth playing through again that you can see all the content again, even just beyond getting to play the game. The other one that I think is interesting um, was uh, Tales of Symphonia. 
where you, based on your performance in a battle, you get this certain type of point. I forget what it was called exactly, but it's not really that useful in the game. You're not really sure why it's there mm-hmm. until you get to the end of the game, and then you figure out that it's basically your overall score for how well you did throughout the game. And you can spend those points to get certain perks for your second playthrough. Um, now, what's interesting is it can be extra challenges. It can be things like uh, you do you gain more experience, so you can level up more quickly. Um, all sorts of stuff like that. But then there are certain perks that seem like they might be really cool that you can't afford yet. And so you actually play through again with a few of the perks um, with the goal in mind of performing better and better in order to afford the perks you might use for, say, your third playthrough. Um, not assuming you want to play a 40 to 60 hour RPG <laughs> that's, yeah. uh, several times, but I think that's a really interesting system, though, for um, incentivizing um, and giving you new motivations each time you play through. So an example I thought of for a game that you would think would be replayable, but in practice really isn't. At least it wasn't for me. Pretty much any Pokemon game. Because Mm -hmm. I really like the idea of going through and playing again. Because in theory, every time you have a new party of Pokemon in your collection, Mm -hmm. you would think that would be a very, very different game. But uh, for some reason, that just fell flat to me. Like, Mm -hmm. I love the idea of going back and... Do do you think there the the issue might be that the Pokemon games are kind of... Very, well, I wouldn't. I don't know about. I, don't, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not really a huge Pokemon fan, so Neither I'm not going to rip on it too much. But um, I, the few that I have played, it seems like very similar experience. It's each time. basically the same. So game. It, exactly, why would you replay it when you could really just wait for the next one to come out and then have a slightly different experience? Well, what's interesting is that not only is it so unreplayable that I don't want to replay the game, it's that I don't even want to play any other Pokemon game anymore because <laughs> I feel like I've gotten the whole experience. Exactly. <laughs> I think that the. I think Pokemon has less replay value and more end game value, in that you play through the story and then you can keep playing for many, many, many more hours Until because you catch them all. very often, yeah, very often it actually opens up the world somewhat to the point where you can catch more than just like the 150 Pokemon. This is at least in later games. Yeah, there's like the 150 Pokemon that you can catch from that game, mm-hmm. but then there's kind of this new area that you can unlock after you've cleared the game that gets you like a whole bunch more Pokemon, and then it's all about like leveling up your ideal team and then kind of taking it into um, multiplayer, you know, potentially battling, you know, other trainers who have been training up their Pokemon um, and, you know, not to necessarily... So it's not replayable, it's more like just an ongoing experience. Yeah, exactly. And I was going to say, too, that part of replayability, and this is maybe another category we'll come back to in a bit, Mm -hmm. is anything with a multiplayer component, where you keep playing the game over and over again, or you keep continuing the game, in the case of Pokemon, more so than replaying. But you don't really Um, finish a a multiplayer game. No, you don't. So it's not really replaying so much as just playing for a long time. Yeah. I don't know. And that's maybe something that we can... That's a really good question, is Mm -hmm. can something be replayable... If you never stop playing the first time, yeah, mm-hmm. it, or, or if there is like, no end experience, really. yeah, right. Well, was last week's discussion when we were talking about finishing a game or, or beating a game, mm-hmm. either one. Did, did we finish that discussion? I don't think mm-hmm. we did. But we I, beat it. We're replaying it right <laughs> but now. But we can replay that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think we finished the discussion because we ended the podcast, but we didn't quite beat it. We could have. We could have mastered that discussion a little bit more. I'll, I'll give you that. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Regardless, it, if there is a point where you go, "Wow, that game was good," I'm going to start over. I would consider that replayability mm. as opposed to playability or continued playability. Mm, yeah. Like Minecraft, um, if you're on the same world and the same server, whatever it is, you're, you're not replaying it. You're just continuing to play it. Would you say starting a new world is replaying? Um, yeah, I might say that. On what basis? Um, that you're starting from scratch. Okay. Yeah, I would agree with that. It's too. the same experience as having to punch trees again. Mm-hmm. For right, right. You're, you're way back. So you're replaying. replaying you, you've been right reduced now. to punching trees. Right. Yeah. So... So, like to get into this nice. question, and I know um, this this other one is, is something that we don't necessarily have to talk much about, but there is that other element of replayability, which is just uh, games that have a second quest, mm-hmm. a slight difference in the next playthrough, like A Legend of Zelda tends yeah. to do that. Mm-hmm. But um, we all kind of know what that is. Uh, what I wanted to focus on really was um, the the actual quality that a game might have that makes it replayable. Like, what can we point to anything oh, wow. where mm-hmm. you can say, hey, like like I... This game has X, and therefore I want to replay it. Let me, it let me take up for the underdog here and start by saying I don't replay games very often. Mm. Um, for the same reasons you've stated in the past, Jim, that you your time is precious. Um, if I've played a game, I really don't want to go back in and replay it. Uh, there are very few exceptions. I have played um, Bioshock, the first one, all the way through three times. I have played uh, the... Uh, 
uh, Enslaved Odyssey to the West, like maybe twice all the way through, um, and, and started a third. That's like it. Mm. Uh, most games I just don't replay. What's interesting is nothing fundamentally changed about those games when I replayed them. It's just that I enjoyed them so much the first time. I wanted to recapture that experience that I had from, I'll go ahead and say, the narrative or the world or the immersion that occurred, the fun I had from that first. Now, yeah. Yeah. If, if, by right. our, if I by our previous definition, Minecraft does count, then yeah, I've played lots of Minecraft worlds, mm-hmm. and I've mm-hmm. replayed Minecraft quite a bit. But that's different, because there's yeah. no narrative there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So my answer to the question is, a narrative that was so strikingly good in a world that was so completely captivating mm-hmm. that I wanted to experience it again, even though it wasn't fresh and new. Or, or I would say, just to add a little bit to that, and then I'll, I'll give you the floor, Nick, but um, the characters as well, and I think that's why I've oh, replayed. Yeah. That's why I've replayed Chrono Trigger more than once, is because um, I really uh, fell in love with the cast, and so I want to, you know, go on that same sort of journey again with that same cast of characters. Um, in my experience with the replayability, I've got I've got two major examples, and the, they kind of illustrate two different points. The first is, uh, as I mentioned before, Knights of the Old Republic, which I've replayed many, many, many times. Um, and I think part of what makes me want to replay that game isn't necessarily how good the game is. I mean, it's a good game, mm-hmm. and but I, I mean, in theory, I could just be satisfied with playing it once and be be done with it. But it's I think like a, it's like a good version of Mass Effect. Yeah, exactly. That's what we can, what we can kind of say about it. Well, Mass Effect is just a crappy version of it. There you go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I like Mass Effect. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't mind it. Anyway, um, but with Knights of the Old Republic, part of the reason I replay that game is just for nostalgia's sake because I was pretty young when I first played that, and that was like one of the first games that like got me really, really into gaming. Like when I was old enough to start comprehending video games. So I wonder if part of the reason we play replay games is just for nostalgia and like trying to recapture. I do think nostalgia is part of it, and you know, kind of what you were saying, Doc, is trying to like recapture that that experience of doing it for the first time. Yeah, because, because I would never play yeah. Ocarina of Time again, mm-hmm. if, I've, if not for nostalgia. I've gathered that like I never wanted to play it again after the you, first time. I you played. never really can recapture that Stick same that. that same experience, <laughs> and that's I think this is you know, maybe we're getting really deep here. Like this is kind of a thing in oh. life, you can't really recapture. Some of those things that you've already experienced, you know, like have some healing time, now. <laughs> like you know, but midlife can, crises, but let me ask and you this, though, youth or can, whatever. And do you think you can have nostalgia experience those feelings of nostalgia for something that you've never even played before? Because yes, because I think yeah, and I and I, I would think so. I think certain games, um, if they're within, if they're if they sort of are in the same vein as the games that you maybe grew up with, or maybe they. they even if it's not related to a game, it gives you a sort of feeling or experience or evokes an emotion that makes you feel... Mm-hmm. Um, Some art is just inherently nostalgic. Precisely, yes. Yeah. So there's that element, too, where perhaps a game just, just strikes a chord with you mm-hmm. and it, yeah. it speaks to you personally. Yeah. So you want to experience mm-hmm. it again and again. And sometimes, you know, even if you can't recapture that same feeling, replaying the game reminds you of the feeling, yeah. which can be satisfying in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Um to kind of go backtrack just a little bit to, you know, kind of like what we think that game has. I think, Doc, your point of it having a good, compelling narrative that really mm-hmm. strikes you is one thing. I think, though, that you can also say to an extent that if a game has a lot of really great moments in it, they were memorable to you. Even if the story itself wasn't particularly good, I, I think that Legend of Zelda like does have a good story. But I think The Legend of Zelda is nicely replayable because you remember doing, getting to do certain fun things in dungeons. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And if the if a game has a lot more cool, memorable, replayable moments in it than not, then it makes it more replayable than a game that's more just like dull, whatever, uncreative, doesn't matter. And that kind of draws in with the point, um, the second example I was going to give, mm-hmm. which is uh, Gunpoint, which mm-hmm. is the Tom Francis game that I mentioned last week. Mm-hmm. Um that game is a very short. It's only about two hours long on your first sitting, and mm-hmm. it can, you can get through it in a half, an hour and a half if you want. Um, yeah, it really is. The story is pretty good. It's an interesting sort of crime noir, esp- espionage sort of story. But the gameplay, it's such a complete experience that's kind of just one sitting. Um, the gameplay is really excellent, and you feel the satisfaction every time you complete a puzzle. So I feel like almost... 
having just one big complete experience that you can redo mm-hmm. over and over again, which is relatively linear, but there is some sort of there is a bit of branching in that game mm-hmm. uh, from a narrative standpoint. Mm-hmm. So there's there's many different ways to solve the puzzles in each level, right. which I think is another thing. Yeah, yeah. because Dishonored is a, is another. Yeah, you can have game. different builds, and, different play and styles. I, each and exactly. I think I think this sort of gets us to we're sort of beating around the bush on this next point that yeah. I wanted to make, but that's that's this idea of. Um, not not so much challenge. I mean, it is challenge, but uh, games that you're replaying because uh, you feel like you're doing a little better at the game the next time through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This almost goes back to an arcade element where we used to have points that would specifically tell us, oh, look, I did better because mm-hmm. I've scored more points. Mm-hmm. So this was, especially back in the arcade game, uh, arcade days, I should say, um, you'd want to replay, say, you know, Donkey Kong or Pac-Man um, or you know Galaga or something because you're going to do better and better each time you play and and you're going to feel like okay now I'm really good at this game now I'm even better at this game mm-hmm. and um, that that sort of feeling you can sort of get with um, a game like um, and also arcade style games but like uh, Gradius mm-hmm. um, a lot of uh, shoot 'em up games are like this too where you're going to replay it you're going to go through and you're going to beat the game and and the challenge of that those sort of games is not so much to beat them. Um, and not not to say that they're easy to beat, but the challenge isn't, so, isn't really to beat them. It's to beat them um, with the highest score that you could possibly mm-hmm. get. And there's kind of like a, a little bit of a sort of time trial element to that, you know, competing against yourself, trying to better yourself. And, but I think it can also tie credit, into... the one credit victory, mm-hmm. which I uh, yeah. didn't want to cut you off too, though, mm-hmm. too much there. But mm-hmm. that, that idea of I'm going to beat the game... In one credit. ...without yeah. actually dying once. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that in a way, if you're sort of excluding though the idea of like doing it just for your own gratification, there's also an element of kind of like social competition, kind oh, of being yeah. able to put your name at the top of the leaderboard and say I'm the best, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and, and also to tell people, hey, you know what score did you get? Oh, I got a hundred thousand more points than you. Yeah. I'm so much better. I yeah. have all this free time. And I think that kind of ties <laughs> a little bit into the, the same idea with multiplayer. Like keep mm-hmm. playing a multiplayer game um, to keep improving and to keep getting you know, better at that competition. That's more direct competition. But I think that competitive element is something that can keep people going for a while. Um, a little bit, this is kind of a divergent point on multiplayer games, but with cooperative games, um, let's take Borderlands, for instance, if you were playing local multiplayer or something like that. Um, playing with a different person could be a very interesting mm-hmm. experience. Than, like if you, if you played by yourself once and then played with another friend mm-hmm. a second time, or played with a different group of people the third time. Mm-hmm. I've played Borderlands through many times. Mm-hmm. Like, I've played a couple of playthroughs by myself. I've played several playthroughs with Chris, with, mm-hmm. you know, groups of four people. Uh, every time you play with a different group of people, it, it's a different experience. That's very true. Especially if you change up your classes each time. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, we've, we've been talking freely about different genres of game, mm-hmm. and by which I mean, you know, game play styles. Mm-hmm. But Something like a, a roguelike is, by definition, a replayable game. Meant to be replayable. Point. Right. You know, you play for five minutes, die, and, and immediately replay. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point. And to something on the other extreme, kind of like the stuff we talked about last time with autosaves, where you really, even if you die, you're, you're all still playing all part of that same experience because you're basically picking up where you left off. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in between there is the game that is replayable. If you know what I mean, it's it's you know the game I mean. that that you finished and you picked up again to play again, hmm. or maybe you abandoned and started over to play again. Hmm. Well, let me let me ask you this question. I'll go around the table here, but um, have you all ever played a game where you finish the game or you beat the game? Yes, I should say. And then right when you're done, you're like, okay, I'm going to pick it up and I'm going to play it again. Okay. Uh, for me, that would be Dishonored. Um, I played. T- that, through that game twice, pretty much immediately, um, because that that game is very much uh, based on not so much. Well, yes, there is a lot of choice in that game because the premise is being able to either assassinate or save or, or like spare your target in, in each level, um, and there's lots of choice. But also just the fact that you're you're the way that you. If you choose to kill a lot of people, that'll affect the outcome of the game. And if you choose to sneak past without killing people, that'll affect the outcome of the game. But also just the fact that you, every time you play through, you have a different sort of build that you're going through because you get points that you can put towards stats and weapons and powers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So by the time you're you know five levels in, 
on one playthrough, you might have a completely different mm -hmm. approach to the to the gameplay mm -hmm. than you would on a different level. Yeah. For instance, my first time playing through, I did a lot of magic spells, but one time I actually did a playthrough where I had I didn't use any of the blink abilities. All I would do is jumping and stabbing and shooting mm -hmm. using real weapons. That was a completely different mm -hmm. game. Yeah. So I think that's part of the appeal of people who replay Skyrim a bunch of times is that different build. Um, mm -hmm. I think even Transistor had elements. We talked about Transistor in a, yeah. in a round table a while back mm -hmm. where I could see the appeal of replaying. And it's another relatively quick game that you can get through and try a bunch of different styles mm -hmm. in relatively quick succession. Totally different builds. It feels um, like a completely different game. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Not not just not just a different build in a game, but like a like different approach to playing entirely, especially with Dishonored. Mm -hmm. and, and to go in a totally mm -hmm. totally different direction from that, um, I know that uh, when I was when I was younger, I was really obsessed with a couple of games, uh, Doom and uh, Diablo, and I, I remember I replayed both of those games. Um, right after I finished, mm -hmm. more than once, and mm -hmm. Doom, it's essentially you're getting the same experience every time, but um, you. It, just the the joy. First of all, it's a very quick game, but mm -hmm. also the joy of playing through those levels and trying to beat your time to get through. Try to get as far as you can and beat the level, uh, or as fast as you can to beat the level, um, gives you that reason to replay it. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to Diablo, you have the uh, each of those dungeon levels are um, procedurally generated, but in a in a almost a curated fashion because mm -hmm. they have these little procedural chunks. Mm -hmm. So you're always looking for that best piece of equipment mm -hmm. and. Yes, there are there there were uh, three different classes, I believe, just three in the original, but you could get um, even by playing the same class a different experience mm -hmm. playing through it because um, of the way that the, the the loot drops were random or uh, randomized, and so you would have a slightly different character, a slightly different build. Um, the dungeons would be similar but also different because the layouts would vary. And I think, Jamie, you've sort of hit on an important point that I think actually is kind of core to all of these examples we're giving. Um, the Doom example where you talk about beating your time, or I know that Doom, for example, has like, you know, you collected all the items or, you know, you killed all the enemies or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, Metroid has a thing where it talks about how, like, what percentage of the map you explored or what percentage of the mm -hmm. stuff you collected. And it's a time um, element there, too. Mm -hmm. I think the important thing that I'm starting to notice as a commonality between all these is that the game lets you know that you can go back and play the game better. Mm -hmm. um, or you can play it in a different way. It's it, The game is very clear about the fact, like, it, it doesn't even have to be overt about it necessarily. It's easier when it's overt, and it tells you, hey, you did 80%, and you can go back and replay and try to do 100%. But if the player understands as they're playing that something could have been different, um, and something I think maybe part of our problem with Telltale games is that it gives you the illusion that that could have been the case. Yeah, but it's, and, but but it's not. Sure. Uh, yeah. But... You know, even with Mass Effect and going back and replaying Renegade versus Paragon, you know that if I go back and replay the game, I can I can have a different experience, mm -hmm. and maybe that's part of the replay the replay value is that you are aware that it has replay value even the first time through. To answer your question, Jim, the answer is yes. I often say immediately I'm going to go back in and start again, and and sometimes I do, but I very rarely finish. I'll usually play for an hour or two in that. Mm -hmm. uh, Fallout's a great example for me, actually, yeah. um, excluding four because it was a different thing. I always play, you know, the savior of the wasteland, and then I go back through and I play a sort of a darker female character who's a really bad girl kind of thing. And what I discover about an hour and a half in is that it's not a fundamentally different enough gameplay experience mm -hmm. to make me want to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really what it comes down to for me. And uh, the other half of that is. I played it the way I wanted to the first time. I liked that hero aspect. I play games to be the hero, not yeah. not to be some kind of uh, supervillain. So you're saying you you felt like you were kind of forcing it. You felt like, oh well, I, I feel like oh, I, I knew I was forcing. Yeah. You felt obligated to do it a different way because that's right. What you yeah, felt like and you the content to, for it to be different. And, and and the reward, the payoff for that was not significant enough. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the the acceptance of that probably was there be, any payoff really? Well, I mean, I, it was curiosity. Yeah. It, it actually, it was appealing to the explorer aspect of, of what I, you know the way I play, and the and the payoff of the exploration just wasn't big enough. But I wonder, the big I wonder one, if there if that's a fault of the game not making your choices matter enough. Could be, but what you're really talking about is is creating enough content. Exactly. And that's expensive. 
Yeah. Um, a great example that I can think of is whenever, and I forget the name of the town, but it was in, in Fallout 3, mm. um, whenever you walk into the town and you could either help them or you could nuke them. Megaton. Megaton, Megaton. right? Uh, that was probably the the darkest moment of gaming for me personally, is whenever my character named Vixen Fox, because she's always named Vixen Fox, uh, went in and actually did that quest line and nuked the town. I was like, okay. Yeah, I got what I wanted out of that, which was the the curiosity. I'm pretty much done with this playthrough now, and I just left it, just abandoned it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, geez, that 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 kind of opens up a whole other topic about because such a binary choice there between being like their hero and nuking the entire town. Yeah. And to me, it's that because it's such a dark choice to just completely nuke it. It completely took me out of the experience to where I. I it became a joke choice. Like it became something where it's like, I can't take this seriously as a real choice because no one's really going to make this choice. Like you have to be a complete. And why why isn't there a darker choice that isn't just like totally crazy. More more, more appropriate would be, it's going to go off. Do you, make the effort to save them or not. Right, not just decide, oh, I'm going to nuke yeah. them. Or, or That's a getting into of... a trolley argument there. Right. But, uh, you know, it, the, the problem is really that the mainline quest for that game specifically was, I'm going to go find my father. Mm-hmm. And in 4, it's, I'm going to go find my son. Right? The, the problem with all of that is, a good person does that. Mm, right. Period. It sets you up with that polarity. The mainline quest is, by definition, a hero's quest. And so if you're going around like some kind of, um, you know, deranged psychopath and trying to do a thing. And and this is one of the things that I think that uh, Mad Max did extremely well. It actually challenged that idea. And there's a character in it who goes, what are you doing? You have just killed hundreds of people. Do you even care? Are you forming meaningful relationships? You used to have a wife and child. Does that mean anything to you? Uh, are you a soulless automaton? Are you empty mm. inside? And, and, and every mm. time you go back to him, he asks you these questions. And it's brilliant because as a yeah. player, it mm. makes me go, oh, geez, mm. you know, I really am that, killing that's, that's, well, hundreds of people. Well, um, I just wanted to say, and I think I think we're... we're Getting a little bit off off of the focus from uh, replay that's <laughs> from replayability, yeah. and so what I kind of wanted to say because we actually are getting close to our, our time limit here is that uh, we sort of touched on a lot of extra points that maybe we can uh, revisit next time. We should stick a pin but in morality in games. I, I do I do think it's worth going back and discussing more uh, about morality in games, yeah. and specifically modern modern game morality versus um, the way that morality might have been approached in earlier game systems, but. Um, just to kind of uh, close out this discussion on replayability, um, does anyone have any closing thoughts on this topic? Only that there is a difference between the mechanical replayability that you mentioned, such as in Doom, mm-hmm. where the story really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. Well, you're in there to, to, to shoot demons and feel like an awesome badass. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and so replaying that game, you're doing it for a different reason um, than if you've got this heavy, heavy narrative game and you're like, you know what, I want to experience that story again mm-hmm. within the context of the mechanics. But see, I would argue that, that they are related because you are trying to get... You're trying to re-experience the game. Yeah, you are. And whether you're trying to re-experience the story of the game and the characters and the events, or if it's just the gameplay is, is so fun, you want to have that yeah. same experience. Yeah, I mean, when you start a game with really fun gameplay, you just want to keep playing the game more. So yeah. when you finish it, you might as well play yeah, it again. That makes perfect sense. Right. I don't want to get this to get into a narratology versus ludology argument. Mm. What I want is to just kind of point out that... I wasn't even thinking about the games that I replayed from a mechanical standpoint when you mm. asked your question. Um, the games that I think about personally as I replayed that game are the ones I, I came out with a narrative perspective. Mm. Um, but you know, all of the roguelikes and things like that—I don't even—I don't even count those. Um, there, I would there are plenty you. of games that I've replayed. Yeah, and I would say I, I think with, you made a good point earlier about the roguelikes. Um, I don't even think you can count that as replaying mm. because the whole. The whole system is built for you to replay. Mm-hmm. So really, by playing the game, by by replaying the game, you are playing the game yeah. as designed. I was just thinking the same. So thing. I wouldn't really say that you can replay a roguelike unless it's you play it for a, a you know say sixty seventy hours or something, and you keep going, and then you put it away and you come back to it like five years later or yeah. something. I guess that'd be a replay. But otherwise, I would say no. Yeah. So uh, um, Nick, since you're our guest, uh, do you want to close us out here with uh, any sort of final thought you have on replayability? Uh, well, I haven't played this game, but I've seen it played, um, and this is a 
a whole new can of worms that I'm opening, but Undertale. Oh. oh. That that kind of replayability. Brian, are you listening? Where it, where it gets really meta yeah. and almost punishes you for replaying the game, mm. in a sense, narratively speaking. Mm. That's that that could be an interesting sort of topic of discussion. Because um it it gets meta about the way that you optimize your playthroughs where like I'm gonna go through and kill every monster in this world or I'm gonna go through and spare every monster in this world and it this characters react to you differently every time you do that. Yeah. So essentially the, the, the next playthrough changes based on your previous playthrough, is that what you're saying? Yes. And also the game gets re- really weird about how there's a character. Metadata. There's metadata. There's metadata. Yeah. Saved, yeah. It, it, yeah. You can't replay the game from scratch ever because it, every, every time you play through the game, it saves forever. And Unless ever. you literally uninstall. And right. Of course. Yeah. But well, yeah. There's, you, you there's always cheating. And that gets us back to last week's topic, which was mm-hmm. finishing game versus beating a game. Mm-hmm. You can't ever beat that game the same way twice. So right. To speak. Right. Which is mm-hmm. interesting. Interesting. Cool. I think this was a very constructive uh, topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I'm looking forward to our morality discussion soon. (laughs) That could also come in with Undertale, too, Mm -hmm. if any of you have played that. I'm hoping it will be a good talk. (laughs) No? Yes? Okay. Uh, That's that's a very binary. uh, Yeah. (laughs) I know what you did there. And on that note... It's a neutral talk. Yes, and on that note, Chris, do you want to take us out? Thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode number 63 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Doc. I'm still Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.